Um, I'm going to be reading uh, from my short story entitled A Roman Incident. Um, and the beginning of that is uh, here. Okay. An average human stomach can hold 10 pounds of food before it begins to tear. Two standard sacks of potatoes. An unimaginable, unimaginable to most, but there are those who dare to dream bigger. The, it's the prologue. Right? I don't know. I don't know how. To, I don't know. I don't know how. I barely know how to read. It's okay. Um, to Charlie's immediate left stood a man who'd once eaten 21 pounds of grits in 10 minutes. All along the table in front of her, clad in the same free T-shirt she wore, adventurous amateurs stood shoulder to shoulder with vetted professionals who made their living rushing down enough food to kill civilians. Charlie prayed that in 10 short minutes, she'd have earned a place in the fellowship of the latter. Icy terror filled her empty stomach. She could afford to lose some of her nerve, but none of her appetite. She closed her eyes and counted down from 10. And then she lost her place. At zero, the world completely exploded. Lights flashed, buzzers blared, and a crowd of thousands, surging like a boar tide, crashed into the security gate. Their cacophonous excitement splashed onto the stage, along with waves of their beer. Charlie was face down in her fourth mouthful of chicken when Pavlovian reflex gave way to human awareness and she realized what was happening. The Hooters World Wing Eating Championship had begun. Her destiny was at the bottom of the pile of poultry parts in front of her. She couldn't afford to be reckless. Every wing had to be clean in order to count, so she quickly rendered each to polished bone before moving on to the next. Behind her, behind her a gorgeous girl in emphatically tight orange shirt, shorts held a scorecard above her head. The woman bounced and smiled and cheered, faking her enthusiasm the way Charlie imagined her mother had taught her. In part of her heart, Charlie would always bear a hateful jealousy of women like this. She begrudged them their big, friendly breasts, their happily bulging hips, all the legible parts of their bodies that spoke woman in every language. Charlie's inscrutable frame would never carry that confident kind of currency, and she scorned the pretty girls for their oblivious luck. When she was nine, she'd posted a note on the fridge that said, Charlie is a girl and she needs new clothes. End of discussion. <laughs> Some years earlier, to get out of an intervention, Charlie's father had declared that the words end of discussion meant exactly that in the Eaglehorn household. It was family law. The phrase had been employed when she was 12 and demanded to go on hormones, and most recently at 17, when she declared her intention to become a professional speed eater. One minute down, one bowl of wings eaten. Charlie's heart kicked like a mule. Anxiety throbbed in her temple. Her jaw stiffened too quickly she knew that if she didn't calm down and steady her pace, she'd be lucky to finish it all. But she was operating on a level baser than prudence. It was the reptile part of her brain that was grabbing and chewing and swallowing. She couldn't hear the sloppy roar of the crowd or the grunting gluttony of the, com of the competition. Like the few other women on stage, she was pelted with the countless ugly words for girl that fly so easily from the mouths of angry, drunken men. She blocked it out. She'd had practice. Tears and snot gushed down her face. She was soaked in a marinade of sweat and buffalo sauce. Grab, chew, swallow. Each spicy wing tasted more like styrofoam, and her cheeks bulged with unchewed meat. Every bedraggled second took a lifetime to pass. It was beginning to feel like home. She'd been raised by a pair of New England hippies who'd moved to Alabama because they liked the leaves in autumn and equated dirt roads with rustic honesty. 
The Eagle Horns settled in, settled in a truck stop town outside of Montgomery called Hope Hull, which was an appropriate name for a place so utterly gutted of anything worth looking forward to. The Charlie is a Girl campaign had been one of the most successful political movements in its entire history. As a homeschooled hippie whelp growing up on the fringe of an outskirt town, she was practically invisible to anyone who, who didn't share their meals with her. Between her mother's homestyle lopsided haircuts and her father's surprisingly successful approach to homeopathic endocrinology, those lucky enough to lay eyes on her were neither certain of nor curious about what they were looking at. Her parents claimed her as their daughter and, so long as you didn't have the audacity to dye your hair pink or the nerve to be dark-skinned, Hope Hull's residents were a proudly credulous bunch. Charlie suddenly realized she couldn't remember the last time she'd taken oxygen into her lungs. She wondered how long her animal mind had been screaming. All the pain and confusion she'd foisted on it was immediately hers to deal with again. Four more minutes had passed, four and a half more bowls, 55 wings in all. The top half of her body was covered in gore. Her jaw glowed white hot with pain, her esophagus burning with the sensation of being strangled from the inside out. She tried to swallow, but the blockage in her throat only shuffled in place. She snatched a cup of water from the table and gulped it down. The lump lurched mercifully. As it finally moved to take its rightful place in her stomach, she gasped a great mouthful of air, and the agony all over her body began to register on an all-too-conscious level. Her fingers hurt. She took another deep breath and closed her eyes. She forced herself to master the pain. She refused to go back to hustling arrogant rednecks at the off-ramp burger joints that compose Hope Hole's economy. At one time, those moments had been proud and meaningful victories. Now, they felt more like the glory day nails in her inevitably mediocre coffin. She was willing to eat her way out of that shit splat town, even if it killed her. She picked up another wing just in time to catch a blur of green glass in her periphery. The bottle cracked her just above the eye and everything went white in an instant. Charlie had been hit before, of course. By her mid-teens, she traded her beanpole adolescent androgyny for a sexlessly amorphous obesity. To the idle and idiot youth of Hope Hull, Charlie was a chimera of cardinal social sins. She was fat, opinionated, and ineffably weird-looking. She had the disturbing habit of reading for pleasure, and her free-spirited Yankee kin might, well ha might as well have been Martians. The girls spit in her hair and laughed at her back. The boys called her a faggot because she confused them. She pun they punched her, she punched back, and slowly they all learned how to fight together. Her sole companion was a pig-nosed girl named Lulu, who brazenly forced the friendship to garner disapproval from her pig-faced family. In fluttering flashes, the world began to focus. She'd staggered back from the table, was, but was still in the competition. Precious second, seconds had been lost to semi-consciousness, and she warded off wary medics to keep from losing more. The red in her eye might well have been buffalo sauce. Her throbbing head reminded her of home. She wanted to sleep. She needed to eat. She split the difference and looked around. Four minutes to go, and only eight of the original 20 competitors still stood on, stood on the line. For the first time, she could see that just past the grits eater and a bloated man wearing novelty sunglasses stood Sonia Thomas, the Black Widow. She was a spelt Korean-born woman who had managed a Burger King before becoming the second highest ranked gurgitator on Earth. She held a dozen world records and, according to the scoreboard, a chicken wing that would put her 26 points out of reach. Charlie's stomach suddenly felt like a much smaller place. Somewhere outside of her body, she could see herself chewing again. She had never planned on beating Sonia Thomas. She had only prayed she wouldn't show up. Some people want to kill their idols. 
but Charlie didn't want a fight. She just wanted to get out of Alabama. A mechanical walt settled over her body, grab, chew, swallow. She, she struggled to distract herself from the replete pain and doubt welling up in her gut. She thought back to home and the perpetual motion of her life as a podunk pariah. In the dregs of her diffidence, she knew that she'd fed the beast, had let the hurt go deeper than skin and grown fatter, weirder, even meaner as a result. She'd craved the hard touch of a town that would never claim her as their own, never love her, never brag about her. Her hope had been shining through an ever-clenching pinhole, but in that lens, she'd seen the widow competing on television. Charlie recognized her kindred in strife, another misfit among rubes. She saw in Sonia Thomas a whisper of freedom, a liberty to dance on the edge of womanhood and thrive. Charlie's training had started the spring she turned 17. Her parents met her intentions of becoming a major league eater with a skepticism bordering hostility. 17 years of semi-responsible parenting had severely moderated the Eaglehorn idea of acceptable life goals. Really, they worried that their chronically unpopular daughter's plan to etch a living, shoving food down her throat was a proposition in suicide. She'd had to declare the discussion ended more than once. In fact, she'd never been further from death. Her regimen was modeled on what she could glean from her idle, sporadic television appearances and the internet. It was surprisingly in step with the recommendations of modern medicine. Eight hours of sleep at night, daily jogs, and a strict 1,700 calorie a day diet filled with fruit and vegetables. Of course, eating all that food at once isn't in many fitness manuals to say nothing of her bi-weekly all-you-can-eat workouts. But the overall improvement in Charlie's health was undeniable. By the fall, she'd lost 78 pounds and gained the beauty and confidence of a girl who truly believes she has control over food. Her public enthusiasm of eating competi competitions did her few favors with her peers, but her reclaimed featherweight kilter and the off-brown hormones her father bought her online had given her a peculiar prettiness that at least kept the boys from throwing rocks at her. Her friendship remained a social pitfall Lulu alone was willing to risk. With 30 seconds left, something was very wrong and getting worse. The 83 wings she'd somehow swallowed were now in open revolt. Terror tied a knot in her stomach, making her nausea feel all the more urgent. She'd eaten beyond her means. Charlie was going to throw up. Her breath came in shallow gulps. She wobbled drunkenly as her strength began to break and she closed her eyes. Clammy certainty enveloped her. Vomiting was intractable and inevitable, but desperately needed to be stalled. If a drop of her sick touched the table before the clock run out, she'd be disqualified. A great wave of adrenaline washed up the last bit of resolve she'd so jealously buried. It was immediately followed by the half-digested ambition at the back of her throat. Charlie's hands shot to her mouth. A gleeful explosion of pleasure roared out of the voyeuristic crowd. Her shoulders heaved as though she'd been shoved by an invisible hand, and she teetered slightly forward. The drool in her mouth tasted like batteries. The mess in her guts came flooding out over her lips and into her waiting palms. She shuddered violently as she buckled and began to fall. The buzzer screamed out over the chaos. The championship was over. Charlie's world strobed into blackness and she collapsed unconscious into a pile of puke and victory. It's <laughs> a good line. Um, <laughs> in her hallucinations, Charlie watched the Big Bang spew forth and begin to eat itself. She perceived a cycle of consumption, the tidal glut of energy that crushes stars and digests the cosmos. At the center of each galaxy sat an endlessly hungry mouth, a black hole that bolted down creation and waited for the final buzzer of doomsday. She, serenely, she recognized all things as an elaborate eating contest. The thought made her happy. 
She woke up to the bright white glow of tarp in the sunshine. Her head lay on a, on a starched, sterile pillow, and a clear tube of saline dripped into a vein in the crook of her elbow. The ebullient bustle of post-competition commotion outside told her she'd been unconscious for only a few minutes, though she felt like she'd witnessed eternity. Sitting up drew the relieved attention of a kind-faced young medic on the other side of the tent. Her heart fluttered, her head throbbed, and he urged her to lie back down. She'd almost died. It was time to rest. In a photo finish, Charlie's vomit had stayed in her hands and off of the table until just after the final buzzer. The rules were clear. She'd officially finished successfully. Charlie was awarded third place, just five wings shy of the grits guy. On the plastic stool next to her cot, paper clipped to a $500 check and a handful of Hooters coupons, was a business card with the International Federation of Competitors Competitive Eaters logo on it. She grinned deliriously, belched, and fell asleep. 